Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll keep this fairly short and sweet. Um, my name is Andrew Hessel. And as uh, George just pointed out, I've been thinking about uh, whether it's time for a new human genome project for some time. I wrote that little piece in Huffington in 2012, but it wasn't the first time I had thought about it. Um, my history in genomics started uh, really quite early on, and not as early as George. Um, uh, most people, a lot of the early history of the first human genome project has, has kind of been forgotten. But it, it was a really radical idea that started to be proposed back in 1984. Uh, it started to pick up some energy in 1985 as, as people came together and started talking about the technical feasibility of the project, uh, and then starting to consider whether it should be done and, of course, how the project would be funded. I first heard about it really when it launched, when it started to get the attention in 1990 with James Watson and the various folks and the large dollars being thrown into genomics. Um, and really, it inspired me to work in the area of genomics. I, I don't know what your entry point into this field has been, but really it was the idea of being able to sequence organisms and look at their code and the, really the instruction set for, for these creatures that just completely thrilled me. And at the time, it was a slow process to read DNA. It was difficult to analyze and interpret. Um, but it was just incredible watching the acceleration of this technology over the next decade. And it really put this science into the, into the public perception. We, of course, there were debates about the technology and, and how it could be used. It turned into an incredible race between public and private and some, you know, some very charismatic uh, and, and newsworthy scientists, uh, but it made it accessible to the public. And of course, when, when President Clinton brought the public and private groups together and essentially declared the draft genome complete, I think it was at 93 percent or something at that point, but still is. Still is. <laughs> Uh, it, it, that was kind of a, a, a moment of closure, at least for the public. There was still, a, you know, the work continued, um, is continuing, but, but now sequencing is just taken for granted. So what was incredibly provocative pushed everyone's capabilities uh, and made careers, inspired, you know, humanity, really fell off into a quiescent period. Over the last, you know, since that, that time in 2000, we've seen the emergence of, of a new technology, uh, being able to write DNA faster and cheaper. And this is, um, it's, it's shaped my career uh, as much as the first Human Genome Project. At the time, I was working for a biotech company. And I said, well, you know, reading the human genome is essentially complete. Why don't we start thinking more about writing technologies? And they weren't interested. They, they, it wasn't a bottleneck for their drug development processes. So I thought, well, I don't want to work for a biotech company that doesn't want to write DNA. So I, I, I left the field and just started to explore the world of synthetic biology. And I had the great pleasure to watch this field emerge over the last 10 years in particular, and I know many of you in the room and, and the work that you do. I don't know where it goes. All I know is we're at very early days of synthetic biology, and today uh, I do a lot of public speaking. Most people haven't heard about writing DNA. They have very little understanding about what the potentials of this technology are. 
what it means to society, what it means to medicine, what it means to humanity. This has always disappointed me. It means either as scientists we're not doing a very good job communicating. Um, it, it just may mean this might be we just need a better marketing department. In 2009, I joined Singularity University. So this is I, I wrote the life science program, the initial draft of it, and this is a group of people that are really forward thinking. That propose dangerous ideas every 20 minutes. And in my first uh, presentation to the executive program that I was teaching, I mentioned it's probably time to write a human genome. And they said, you probably shouldn't talk about that for the moment. It's a little too dangerous an idea. So I'd put it on the back burner. When I, put out, when I wrote the article for Huffington Post, there was just silence. And up until a few weeks ago, if you Googled human genome synthesis, you basically got nothing. There's a void out there. Yet it's that we will go down the path of writing more and more complex genomes, and ultimately human seems to me inevitable. It's not, it's a journey for that we're exploring here today, uh, it's not going to end here today. This is the start of the start of many different things, I'm sure. But I just want to say thank you for having an open mind. Thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing your skills to the table. And I hope in 10 or 15 years when we look back at this moment, um, we're, we're we realize that, we're, that we might be making history today. Welcome. Um, I'm more of a detail guy. Um, so if you could cue the slides, please. Uh, oh, there we go. I'm going to offer up some thoughts uh, on HGP right, as we like to call it, uh, designing and synthesizing modified versions of human genomes, and I need to disclose my engagement in a couple of companies here before I talk. So <clears throat> I think one of the biggest questions on everyone's mind, and it certainly was on my mind the first time Andrew sprang it on us last July, was why and should we synthesize a human genome? And I add to that in cells, and that's a very important addendum. So just a few thoughts uh, before we dive into the details about what we've been discussing and we hope you will discuss with us. Um, we, as you've heard already, we seek to do this responsibly and not using so-called deficit model thinking. Uh, <clears throat> deficit model thinking, uh, I've learned, is you know, telling people why what you're doing is important and going off and doing it. Uh, so a good example of this is the uh, widespread rejection of vaccines by a substantial proportion of our uh, population. They were told it was important. But there was no real engagement or outreach at, at all. And in contrast, uh, a good example of responsible innovation involves the so-called uh, arsenic biosensor that was developed as one of the first synthetic biology projects, where the people in, involved in the project uh, widely engaged government officials, NGOs, and most crucially, uh, the potential end users uh, really understood the problem heard them. Another really important point, as I said, we are talking about doing this in cells, lest there be any confusion on this, i.e. somatic applications. So we don't anticipate uh, that there's going to be a major discussion about germline modification here. That, uh, that discussion is already out there. And uh, we have decided that 
our, our involvement in this is strictly somatic. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a skeptic by nature, and, and it took me a while to warm up to this project. Um, but over the last few months, uh, I've, I've recognized several big drivers for me to say yes and, and not only enthusiastically participate, but really be a proponent of this. I mean, obviously, this is an incredible tool for learning fundamentals of genomes. As you've already heard, technology development uh, will come out of this and have many positive spin-offs beyond human genome for applications to global problems. For example, gene drives could revolutionize health in the tropics, Zika, malaria, dengue, chikungunya. Crop engineering could improve food security through pest resistance, et cetera. And the field of synthetic biology <clears throat> obviously is to some extent limited by how rapidly and efficiently we can make DNA and put it to use. And finally, I'm at a medical center, so the biomedical somatic applications uh, seem very real to me. For example, one can imagine engineering universal T cells or T cell therapies. Uh, revolutions in organ and tissue transplantation, we'll hear a bit more about later today, and perhaps a next generation of gene therapy. Some of my colleagues and I have been talking about a stepping stone project. I'm a basic scientist at heart, and one of the most fascinating aspects of the human genome today is that we've discovered all of these loci on the map that are associated with disease and other human traits. But we really don't understand them because these variations in our genome lie in the so-called dark matter in between the genes. So here's a, a picture of a human gene. And I don't know if there's a pointer here. As most of you know, human genes are made up of tiny little blocks. They're split by much larger re regions called introns. And then if we zoom out, here's that same gene, we see very large gaps between the genes. And thanks to large support by the NIH, there's lots of clues about places in the dark matter that are important for controlling the expression of these genes and therefore um, a better understanding of how they work and how uh, the cause of disease. So we're actually uh, proposing a project we call a stepping stone project uh, right now. Here's a gene, let's call it your favorite gene, where we would make 10, 100 to 1,000 synthetic variants of that gene, assembling these in a yeast cell and then uh, incorporating that very efficiently into a specific human cell line so that we would be able to then evaluate the specific effects of each of these little variations in the dark matter on the expression of the gene and ultimately uh, the function of that gene. So how should we start uh, a larger project to understand the human genome? Uh, you'll hear about pilot projects, and we've decided to sort of promote the idea of 1% of the human genome, but a very informative 1%, not a random 1%, as has often been done in other genome projects, including our synthetic yeast genome project you'll hear more about. These are designed to teach us new biology, develop important tools for therapy, uh, explore new directions, and engineer other non-human genomes. And in parallel with this, technology development will proceed and uh, make the ultimate uh, synthesis of a human genome much more practical. So new technology, new tools, new ways to handle big DNA, integrate it, better defined cell lines, et cetera. And very importantly, um, in order to do this efficiently, we will need to really employ uh, uh, automation in order to make this uh, really fly. And so 
Uh, this is our uh, genome foundry that we are setting up at NYU showing how we're uh, automating one uh, bottleneck in this process. So where do we start with this? As I've said, uh, we're talking about a cell line engineered for safety. This would be presumably uh, an IPS cell so that it would have the capability of being differentiable into different types of tissues. And it would be engineered to have a strict germline firewall. For example, uh, removal of one of the sex chromosomes. So an XO cell line uh, should, would be a simple way to assure that this would not be able to go germline. And these cells uh, can be differentiated into tissues and organoids, models of human organs, uh, to evaluate the functional effects of any designer changes that were introduced. And here in Boston, uh, at the Wies Institute, for example, uh, there are these so-called organs on chips uh, that uh, provide excellent models for lots of processes uh, that happen in the body. So how would we do this? Well, this is obviously a longer discussion, but depending on what exactly we plan to do, uh, that will dictate the ultimate design. 1% uh, pilot, you'll hear me talk about one of those in a bit, might engineer just these short blocks or exons, which are, are very small. These will require relatively uh, small pieces of DNA, but not giant pieces of DNA. Whereas if we were to really do an entire genome synthesis, it, it might benefit from a strategy that you'll probably hear about a little bit later on, used to synthesize a modified version of the yeast genome called SWAPIN, where um, potentially 100,000 DNA letters at a time could be introduced and used to replace the endogenous 100,000 uh, DNA letters. So to make a 3 billion base pair genome would require 3,000 rounds of this. Now that sounds like a lot, but it's not inconceivable by any means. And surely there are many ways to make this more efficient. One very interesting uh, uh, publication that just came out recently was the development of uh, haploid stem cell lines, uh, which could make projects like this much easier. And we'll hear a little bit about those later today. So to wrap up, um, there's two last points I'd like to make, and they have to do with community. And the first one is we don't think this should be a human genome project to the exclusion of other organisms. Uh, as the leader of the, uh, the yeast genome project, uh, I'm keenly aware of this and a huge proponent of appreciating our biological diversity and <clears throat> bringing some of this technology to the many other organisms on the planet for practical reasons and for uh, reasons of dissecting the fundamental biology of the system. For example, um, I think we're already learning a lot from microbial genome engineering. And secondly, um, the scientific community, this is a grand challenge, and as such, it really demands global participation. Uh, we have interested parties here today from Australia, China, Singapore, the UK, and more. I uh, personally think this is a fantastic way to educate an international workforce in genomics to help promote the understanding of the field. And in the words of Huan Ming Yang, the chair of BGI, or Beijing Genomics Institute, as it was formerly known, it's more fun to do it together. We make new friends. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions, and I'm sure my colleagues would as well.
stunned silence. I think that the XO can do the drum line. I mean, your point's a good one. Uh, that's Turner syndrome. Right. It's, it's one. There, there are versions of Turner syndrome where the whole X chromosome is not deleted. And in, but as far as I know, when it's an XO, it's infertile. Yes. Richard. We can't hear, sorry. Um, I just wanted to get your and George's opinion on how easy it would be to hack that firewall. To hack that firewall, well, that's an important question. Um, uh, of course, the, the details of how easy it would be would depend on the details of exactly how that firewall was constructed. Um, so, uh, I can't really answer that, but obviously, since uh, biosafety is an integral part of this, we're going to hear about that later on today. Um, I, I, I expect that uh, the firewall will be improved as the project progresses and will get better and better. But yeah, the details of that are to be determined and, and therefore the impregnability of it uh, is, is a little hard to predict but, but at the moment. But if you're going to hack, you can just do it from scratch. Mm. You know? yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So good morning. Uh, thanks for the chance to talk. Uh, so I'm a postdoc in Jeff's lab, and I've spent the last five years uh, thinking about all aspects of this SC2 project, uh, the Synthetic Yeast Genome Project as has my colleague Patrick Sai, a former postdoc with me and now at Edinburgh. So today we're just going to give you some highlights of this project and the lessons we've learned that I think are really quite applicable moving into larger and larger genome scale synthesis projects. So just to get going, the goal of the SC 2.0 project is, is quite simply stated as to build an entirely synthetic designer genome to power growth of our favorite single-celled organism, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So not just a rewrite, this is actually a redesign and synthesis of something new. And so um, at the outside of this project, there are two defined, or sort of like three um, uh, design principles with competing agendas that were set out. On one side of, this, of the coin, the idea is to build something uh, that has a wild type fitness, a healthy cell. But on the flip side, the genetic code powering it is going to be different and provide new properties, specifically increased genome stability um, and increased genetic flexibility. So how to, how to do that? Um, on the one side, uh, the idea up front was to preserve genome content or gene content so no genes are deleted at the outset. Uh, keep the non-coding DNA intact under the assumption we don't know enough about it. Um, and then take a modular assembly strategy. So the yeast genome is composed of 16 linear chromosomes and 12 megabases of DNA. Um, so to build these chromosomes piece by piece in individual strains, um, progressively building more and more DNA by chromosome into 16 strains and then combine them together and monitor fitness along the way. And on the other side, probably the more exciting side, uh, what are we changing? Deleting all repeats from the genome. This includes uh, TY elements as well as subtelomeric repeats. Uh, deleting all of the tRNA genes from their native positions and recoding them um, onto a neochromosome. And Patrick will talk more about that. He's led that project. Building in a watermarking system so we can understand um, uh, the difference between synthetic and wild type DNA, and recoding a stop codon to um, improve the genetic flexibility, uh, and then a scramble inducible evolution system um, that allows us to change, once the chromosomes are built, this order and orientation and content of genes. So, this required uh, a lot of thought in the design, um, and I'll just highlight a few points here. The design has been applied universally to all 16 chromosomes. All of those changes are built across all 16 chromosomes in a centralized editing process that typically by chromosome involved a yeast genetics expert in collaboration with a computational expert. And all of this was done in the context of custom genome design software uh, built by Joel Bader, who's here today, um, called BioStudio. And this is just a screenshot of that. Uh, so the design is actually quite extensive, and this slide is a video of uh, the editing of synthetic chromosome 5, and so each sort of frame of this video represents a single edit 
Um, and you can see as the genome progressively shortens in size, elements are being deleted. A, a variety of other elements have been sort of popped in along the way as we uh, make base substitutions, deletions, and insertions. Um, going from a 550 to a 520 KB chromosome with extensive modifications. So, in fact, the genome is now designed. Uh, it encodes, uh, or it's missing 750 KB that was previously there. 215 KB has re been recoded, and we've added 130 KB, um, yielding a genome once built that will be 1.1 megabases changed, and it's actually reduced in size uh, substantially. So I'll highlight a few of the technical challenges that I think really um, are going to be important moving forward. One, we had to come up with a DNA assembly plan, and we did that by defining a hierarchy, starting with the design chromosome and splitting it into pro progressively smaller pieces, going from what we call megachunks all the way down to oligos. And these provide different entry points uh, for having DNA synthesized, um, where early chromosomes were built from the bottom up. And with the decreasing cost of synthesis, we're now jumping in at the mini chunk and chunk level um, and having synthesis providers build those pieces for us. Uh, we've come up, Jeff mentioned this program called Swap In that allows us to progressively integrate more and more DNA by switching oxytrophies as we move along the chromosome. In the interest of time, I won't get into the details, but I'm happy to talk about that. We've had to figure out how to debug chromosomes, meaning when designer changes confer a fitness defect in order to comply with our um, design principle number one, how to figure out what those changes were, which specific changes, and then revert them to wild type or make additional changes. And this is an example. The chromosome that I built, SIN6, had a defect of petites, if you're familiar with yeast genetics. And we tracked that back to a single recoding event within an essential gene that led to reduced protein production presumably by a function, as we've learned, of uh, RNA folding, as it turns out. And we've also had to figure out how to consolidate chromosomes. Given that we're building 16 individual strains, we need to put them together. And so we've come up with a strategy that uh, relies on yeast mating, which is obviously a great strategy for yeast and not necessarily applicable to other organisms. Um, and I can talk about that in detail later, if you'd like. Um, another important component of this project uh, has been the education component. Um, and that really was spearheaded at Johns Hopkins, Jeff's former university, um, in the Build a Genome course, which engages undergraduates in this project, building or fragments of synthetic DNA, anywhere from 750 base pairs now up to 10 KB fragments, that then feed directly into the chromosome construction effort. So these kids get an experience like grad school in the sense that they're having lab meetings, but also like biotech in the sense that they are you know, meeting their milestones. That has expanded uh, to a franchise operation at Tianjin University, where uh, the substantial portion of the DNA for synthetic chromosome 5 and 10 was built. And there's representatives from Tianjin here today. So what's the status update on this chromosome, or on this project, excuse me? Uh, so I'm showing you here the 16 linear chromosomes, as well as the new tRNA neochromosome Patrick will talk about, where the blue represents synthetic DNA integrated and wild type is, is in yellow. Um, while all, nearly all of the DNA has now been synthesized for the project, um, about 60% of it in total has been integrated, rep, rec, or representing about seven megabases of the 11.3 of, of the genome. My name is Patrick, and I did my postdoc with Jeff a few years ago and moved to Edinburgh to start my own group in 2013. Um, so I start um, with Jeff, I start the consortium um, internationally and I coordinate the consortium. So just want to t tell you a little bit. So today we have, you know, um, about 10 universities over um, four continents working on this project. And this is probably one of the biggest synthetic biology project in public domain today. Um, this is the map. So we mentioned there are different size synthesizing chromosomes. But there are also different universities like Pasteur, EMBL, which contribute to the project. So as you can see, this is quite a worldwide effort. Um, so how we started? So a few years ago, I met YJ Yuan in Boston um, during iGym. I think that was like 2011. And I know YJ for many years. And I talked to YJ, this is probably the next best thing going to happen in China, because YJ and I started iGym in China in 2006. And then I just took the project on board, and then we organized the first Synthetic East meeting um, in Beijing with Huang Ming Yang. So this you know, is the picture we taken that day in 2012. We all look so young. But what, what we really do is we, we take many people who we think are going to be the key players 
in this project, like you know, Tom Alice and, and people from um, France um, and Belgium and, and Hong Kong and India. And we also fly all the um, funding agencies, including BBSRC um, and Indian um, and funding agencies. We bring everyone into one room, kind of like what we are doing today, and have a discussion what should be done and how we're going to do it. And that was funded by NSF SAVI um, Science Across Virtual Institute, and that really stimulates the whole thing. Um, so with each side, we sign an agreement, right, before we actually start the project. So each in the agreement, I'm going to quickly tell you through what was in the agreement. So each side needs to commit to a certain space, um, 2,000 square meters, um, a minimal. And then each side needs to raise their own funding and they need to commit, dedicate um, personnel to the project. And every side needs to agree on the quality insurance. So for us, we you know, lately talk about the assembly standards, but we also make sure everyone send 100% base pair resolution um, correct DNA sequence to us. Um, we agree on material transform. So we send a consortium, we don't exercise any IP on material. And then we agree on publications, how we you know, swap authorships. But more significantly, we coordinate local submission. So recently, we have a new um, a big batch of papers we just co submitted. And, and some sites, like, you know, lately, the paper was finished early, and she hold a paper for um, at least a year for us. So that was a bit thing for the consortium, is we co submit um, papers. Um, and we support each other's grant proposal. Um, we all agree there's no IP covering SC2 material, and that's really important. And it's free, freely shared but with the third party we saw MTA. And all the software developed in SC2 is open source under BSD. Um, and we also give the ownership to individual site. So once you, you are given a chromosome, you own it, right? So we don't give the chromosome to the other site. So each site has an ownership. Um, and then we have training and education. So we have been training people across site. And then we are compliant with local laws. And there's a paper um, coming out last year on genetics talking about the freedom and responsibility. And this was um, mainly hated by um, Deborah Marshall, who is also here in the audience. We talk about you know, the social benefits of SC2 and the intellectual properties and safeties and governance. So I don't have much time to talk into it, but I just want to tell people a little bit about how we raise money. So in the beginning, the project was funded by NSF Savi to start build a genome in, in Johns Hopkins. But after the first meeting in Beijing, um, Bija and Tianjin got $5 million from the Ministry of Science and Technology um, in China. And Imperi, um, headed by Tom Alice, got uh, money from BBSRC to since us comes on 11. And then when I moved to Edinburgh, we also got some money from BBSRC to do TR near Kamsong. But later on, Susan Russell and I, we got a bigger grant to support large piece DNA census automation in Edinburgh called Edinburgh Genome Foundry. Um, and then later on, we took on board Pasteur at EMBO, who has more specialized technology to the project. So Pasteur is headed by Lomé Kostrua, who does 3C and 3D to look at the chromatin structure of the synthetic chromosomes. And EMBO is using the tRNA seq technology to look into the scramble genomes. And then we got approached by two sites, which are McCurry from Australia and, and Marshall Chang from Singapore National University. So they took on board um, three chromosomes and bring in their own funding from their local governments. Um, so we have a lot of collaborations. So we train people across site. Um, and then we share the um, protocols and expertise. So I just want to quickly show you one, two projects. So within SC2, we also have sub-projects. So this is a Eroxin Bio Grant, which we are going to do um, direct evolution at the genome scale. And this is with, with, um, between UK, um, Germany, France, and, and USA. And then just want to show you the interactions. So the green line means uh, we have joint publications. And the purple line means we have joint grants. So as if, but if I'm also map the ongoing collaboration is going to be all over the place. But I just want to show you this is very active um, collaboration within the consortium. And with that, I just want to point out there will be a meeting this year in Edinburgh. And you guys are more than welcome. Thank you very much.
regarding robustness is interesting to me in that the E. coli genomes that our groups have tried in the past are great in LB and minimal media, et cetera. When you get up to like 5% of a product that you're making in a bioreactor, the minimal genomes just don't stack up to MG1655. So how do you define robustness? And is this a, a yeast can, that can be used in commercial applications, or is it you know, grow well in the lab, and how do you do that? Right. So um, it grows well in the lab. Great. Uh, uh, the scramble system, I think, is really uh, your opportunity to explore a variety of minimal genomes under any condition you want. And those are ongoing experiments right now. Um, and I think you can scramble, um, and it, just to expand on what the scramble system is, we pepper the genome with lox P sites and then just express your Cree recombinase, and uh, that yields potentially massive recombination events um, and new genomes in each cell and in parallel, a huge genetic variation. Um, and so if one takes that population and selects under a condition of interest, one presumably could find anything uh, that is possible biologically. Um, and so I think that is a, a system that will yield incredible opportunity uh, in commercial applications um, because one can scramble and then grow as one desires. Um, When you're comparing the different phenotypes in order to determine that you haven't affected phenotype, um, phenotype covers a very, very wide range of behaviors. How do you, um, with the yeast world even, try and assure that you're getting a large enough selection of uh, comparisons? Right. So we typically start with um, some very simple but robust assays, looking at just colony size under very stringent conditions, high temperature and non-preferred carbon sources. Um, and then we go into more detailed analysis, um, including sort of RNA-seq and looking at the transcriptomic, transcriptomics and proteomics in these cells, um, and evaluating genome-wide and proteome-wide the effects of the synthetic chromosomes. And we find subtle differences. Um, and so it's a great question, what is fitness and what is wild type fitness? Um, we are working our hardest to test as many conditions as possible. Um, one of those, or one opportunity in yeast is to play it on a whole variety of, of different types of media that um, provoke different phenotypes given genetic backgrounds. And so we, we typically do those types of experiments as well. Matthew. What was the most uh, challenging aspect of putting together an international consortium for uh, su such a scientific endeavor? Um, actually, I got one more slide to show you. Um, um, but <laughs> um, really, um, I, I think the, the difficult part is really getting everyone to buy in. So you need to really um, tell each side what's the benefit. And, 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 and having international collaboration coordination is absolutely key. I'm giving myself a pat in the back. Um, but um, also, the project needs to be well defined. Um, so, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, and time bound. And I think that's, that's you know, why this consortium has been quite successful, is because the project needs to be well defined. And I think that's a challenge for a GP, right? You know, we need to define the project what it is, what's it for. Um, and also, the other thing we, I think we did is um, really try to cultivate the culture. So if you ask people what's the culture, I see too. If you know I, I want to say we are quite collaborative, inclusive, innovate and responsible. I think it's try to cultivate the culture in the last few years has been quite um, quite difficult and, and I think we have been quite successful too. Yeah. No more? Okay. Next. Sorry, uh, just a quick question. I'm sorry if you said it. Is the mitochondrial genome also being edited? Uh, indeed it is, and a representative who's working on that is here, Sudarshan Pingwe. Um, and yep, it's undergoing designs. It's an interesting problem. It's about 90 KB and incredibly AT rich, which provides all sorts of opportunity um, for multiple designs and multiple, you know, different builds to find out what works.
So this is my conflict of interest slide. Um, and the question I'm asking is why make millions of synthetic genomes, or billions, or trillions? Uh, and, uh, and I mean this in all seriousness, and I think that's, uh, that's why we want to bring down the cost. So um, this is uh, our progress curve for reading and writing. We are now at the point where we can make synthetic oligos for the entire human genome. In fact, I think this has already been done for various reasons, SNP analysis, expression analysis, and so forth. Assembling that's another matter, and that's this, uh, this lower curve here. Um, let's see, here. Uh, there is a gap between the, the amount that we can synthesize. There's a very small gap between what we can sequence and what we can synthesize. So we're, we can do multiple uh, copies of human genome size things. Uh, but there's a gap in what we can assemble, and uh, the gap becomes even bigger the more radical the changes we make in the genome, such as the ones that, that you'll hear much about today from, from yeast and E. coli. Um, Making billions of genomes combinatorially is, is, is routine. It was, it was fairly routine in 2009 when Harris Wang uh, did this experiment. We, we put in the Nature paper that we had 4.3 billion combinatorial genome variants per day. Um, and they weren't just random. These were really highly designed to optimize the, the, the uh, ribosome binding sites in, in a pathway. If we uh, go forward to today, we have eight major tools for genome uh, engineering and editing. Uh, they either use DNA, RNA, or protein as the, uh, as the matter that, that uh, goes and finds the needle in the haystack, finds that one base pair out of six billion in the human genome and, and edits it. Uh, even though we have crystal structures for most of these, uh, we don't actually have one for lambda beta, uh, to my dismay. Uh, uh, we have a ways to go before all of them are as easy to manipulate. This project that uh, uh, Nili Ostrov will present in a, in a moment uh, uh, started uh, where we changed one genome, uh, one codon genome-wide in E. coli, and we, and we achieved in that project a very efficient use of nonstandard amino acids, uh, biocontainment, that is to say genetic and metabolic isolation, and to our surprise, multivirus resistance. Four different classes of viruses that we analyze in detail are 100 to 1,000 fold down. Um, and this, this was uh, one codon, and then Nilly will tell you about the seven codons, which is a team effort. That is genome-wide. I mean, that happened to be a rarer codon. As you go to more and more codons, you, you really need to do it genome-wide in a genome which is composed mostly of proteins, but in, as we get to higher, uh, u larger eukaryotic genomes, uh, like a mouse, pig, human, and so forth, um, the exons that compose the protein coding regions become sparser, they're about 1 percent of the genome, although it might be most efficient to engineer them with the 100 KB swap ends that, uh, that Jeff uh, described. Uh, but these are examples of sort of coding region level changes where you might want to change the species or the, the viral resistance via recoding. But uh, we've heard how, for the most part, for both uh, yeast, and you'll hear sooner about E. coli, that we've left the non-coding regions intact because we don't understand it well enough to engineer it. But that has to change, and I think that will, that's one of the things that, uh, that we hope to do. And to just show you that even things that seem to be junk DNA, like ALU repeats, have examples where a single point mutation in ALU repeat uh, can cause a change in transcriptional activity and be associated with a leukemia. So we want to engineer the repetitive elements genome-wide, and uh, Luhan Yang will tell us something about that later on. Um, but not just the repetitive elements, but every base pair, uh, because there are chromosome folding rules we know nothing about. And we can, we can multiplex, we can put together a large number of changes uh, into a single genome where the, if you make a heterozygous for every cis-regulatory mutation um, and you can measure allele-specific expression, you can essentially do 20,000, 30,000, there, there are possibly hundreds of thousands of different promoters scattered throughout the large plant and animal genomes. Uh, and we'd like to be able to do that. Uh, we can do them all at once, uh, at least. Uh, 
And so the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements is based on observations of all these uh, epigenetic changes, RNA and, and uh, chromatin changes, and, they are, and there is um, transcription almost throughout the genome. There are uh, binding proteins binding all over the place, and one of the critiques of this project, it's a wonderful project, one of the critiques is just because something binds, just because something is, ex is, is, RNA, is expressed at the RNA and or protein level doesn't mean it's functional. And so to do that, we need the organoids that Alex mm, will talk about uh, as well in order to assess the, the changes to every base pair and try to do as many base pairs at once. We can make ancestral genomes, not just uh, by reading ancient DNA, but by actually constructing phylogenetic trees. So uh, I'm going to get us back on schedule and give time for discussion. I don't even think my two minutes. Do you want to take a couple of questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. If there are any, yeah. So, so the idea is that uh, there's some investment you put into analyzing, uh, if you wanted to do, if you wanted to treat the entire genome as a cis-regulatory element, yeah. right? And even the coding regions we know in some organisms can be a, can be cis-regulatory element. So you've got three billion, let's say, for mammalian genome uh, points that you want to change. And you'd like to, ch and there's an overhead of analyzing that. So let's say you want to change one base pair, and I want to ask, does it affect the liver, the brain, the, you know, there's a, many cell types. You might want to do a serial section through a uh, mouse embryo and see all the tissues that are affected. Well, if you have allele-specific RNA expression, you can, for example, or any allele-specific uh, epigenetics, you can see, and you made an allele-specific mutation, then you can see how it affected one allele relative to the other. You have a beautiful internal control, which is the other uh, chromosome in a diploid. Since, to some extent, those cis-regulatory elements, if, you are, if they're subtle changes, they're independent of one another. So this, this mutation on gene A is not really influenced in a heterozygous state, is not influenced by heterozygous mutation in gene B. So in principle, you could change all the genes subtly in heterozygous state and read them all out in parallel in every cell in the, in the, uh, in the body of the animal or plant. But many of these cases won't be independent. If you, if you, oh, if you greatly overexpress or, or knock out something that's, that's haplo-insufficient, you will have Im impact on other, but if you do enough of these things, I mean, you're, you're, gonna be, you're committing the three billion of these things, uh, you know, so in many combinations. Yeah. Comment on how much of epigenetic editing we'd want to do so you could actually uh, attach TCAS9 to say TET1 enzymes or yeah. DNMTs and think about actually both genetic yeah. and epigenetic targeted modifications. I think that's a very important part of this uh, project for, for two reasons. One is you need to be in control of the epigenetics for certain, either for certain organisms where it's hard to create the whole organism, like say a giant sequoia or a human being, uh, but also so that you can test that you understand uh, the impact of mutations and, and epigenetic changes. Uh, Alex M mm will talk uh, more about this, uh, about how you can make various different organoids and how you can systematically go through epigenetic factors. For example, we now have a complete uh, collection of all the transcri human transcription factors, and you can go through those now systematically in various combinations. Um, I think this is one of the, the coolest part of this project, is being able to come up with high throughput ways of testing developmental biology. Um, ideally, some of it can be done in, in a few microns um, rather than having the expense of a, of a mouse facility or a bowhead whale facility. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>